One of the things that I teach in my support group and what I first start out telling people is compare a diagnosis of dementia with somebody, an older person who's been able to hear perfectly well most of their life and then all of a sudden they have lost their hearing. Now, you wouldn't want to just cut off communicating with that person to because they can't hear what you're saying. Mm -hmm. You're going to find a new way to communicate with that person, whether it be learning sign language or them learning how to read lips or you writing things down on a chalkboard or a piece of paper or getting them, you know, a special telephone to, somehow you're going to figure out a way to communicate with that person so you can continue a relationship with them. It's the same with dementia. Most people, I think, or a lot of people, because it becomes difficult and uncomfortable, it's easier not to communicate with them than have that wedge driven between you. But if you learn a new way, a different way, and an effective way to communicate with them, then you'll continue your relationship in a healthy way, um, just like you would if that person lost their sight or lost their hearing. So that's what I would want people to understand is we're just going to learn a new way, an effective way to deal with this illness so you can continue a healthy and fulfilling relationship with your loved one. Welcome to the All's Authors Podcast. We're so glad you found us. I'm Marianne Shuko, a registered nurse, author, and dementia daughter. Join me each week to listen to one of our 200 plus authors talk about their dementia journey, sharing intimate details and painfully obtained knowledge to help others currently on that path. We hope these stories offer you comfort and support as we strive to break the silence and stigma surrounding a dementia diagnosis. May one of our authors speak to your experience. Content presented on the following podcast is for information purposes only. Views and opinions expressed during this podcast are solely those of the individuals involved and do not necessarily represent views of the Whole Care Network. Always consult your physician for medical and fitness advice, and always consult your attorney for legal advice. And thank you for listening to the Whole Care Network. Lisa Skinner is the author of Not All Who Wander Need Be Lost, a caregiver guide full of real-life stories and practical advice. Her dementia journey started when she was a teen, and her grandmother displayed bizarre behaviors, diagnosed as senile dementia. At the time, resources for families were practically non-existent, and she dedicated her life to becoming an advocate and ally for those on the dementia path. She has witnessed eight family members succumb to Alzheimer's and other dementias, and with her husband served as a relief caregiver for his mother. She also provided dementia care for her beloved cockapoo, Oliver, who was diagnosed with canine dementia. Professionally, she is a behavioral specialist devoted to helping families understand the stages and related behaviors that are associated with dementia illnesses. She considers her career in elder care a calling and has more than 25 years experience starting up memory care programs, counseling patients and their families on dementia care, training caregivers, and working in sales and marketing. In this episode, we discuss dealing with dementia behaviors, how to understand and communicate with those who have dementia, and canine cognitive dysfunction. Hi, Lisa. Welcome to the Al's Authors Podcast. How are you today? 
oh, I'm doing well, and uh, considering the circumstances that we're all under these days. Um, but thank you very much for having me on your show. I appreciate it. Well, thank you for taking time guess. to come. Yes, and we are under the um, stay-at-home orders. In, uh, Lisa's in California, and I'm in New York, and we're in COVID-19. So just to put a date stamp on this interview. So, uh, Lisa, tell us a little bit about your experience with Alzheimer's and dementia. You have both personal and professional years of experience. What's that been like? Well, I think it really has probably turned out to be my calling in life. I've had over 25 years experience professionally working um, with uh, elderly, and I've set up memory care wards and done, you know, the life stations and the reminiscence therapies. And um, all this kind of led to me um, writing the book that I wrote. But in addition to doing it professionally, I've also had eight of my own family members um, that have suffered from some form of dementia. That's quite a lot. Yeah, it's been overwhelming. So I think this is what I was supposed to do. <laughs> and I think you mentioned that your dog also had a form of dementia. Yes. Anybody that has read the book or will read the book, um, I actually included a chapter in the book um, about my dog, Oliver, who passed away about two years ago at the age of 18 and a half. Oh, boy. And the reason why I included him in the book is because – Many, many people aren't aware that dogs also get dementia. Um, I didn't even realize that the dog, that dogs got dementia. And then he started displaying a lot of very similar um, behaviors that I have seen in humans. Mm -hmm. So I took him to the vet and said, you know, this is what I'm seeing. And that's when I, he did some tests. He says, Lisa, you're absolutely right. Your dog does have dementia. And it's very common in dogs that you, and you'll start seeing um, the behaviors that you recognized starting at about age 13. Now, it doesn't affect all dogs. Like, it doesn't affect all people. But it actually is very common. So that's why I, I included that story. Because I wanted people to be aware that dogs do get it as well when they're very um, susceptible to it um, in their older years for exactly the same reason that we are. I mean, a um, hundred years ago, our average lifespan was 40 to 50 years old. Now we're living well into our seventies and eighties. We've come up with all kinds of uh, cures for, um, medical illnesses, but our brains are have aged, and um, there's really no known treatments for the um, for the diseases, the brain diseases that cause cognitive impairment. So mm. we're seeing it in humans, and the rate that we're seeing it in is increasing as um, we age, and also our dogs. And since the dog situation, I've actually talked to several people whose dogs uh, also were suffering from dementia. Hmm. What were the symptoms that you noticed with your dog? Well, he would um, just stare at things for the longest time. And he kind of had a glazed over look. And he uh, seemed very confused at times, but not all the time. So um, it reminded me of a lot of the people that I have um, worked with and family members uh, that, well, I've seen the, the symptoms and it reminded me of them and really kind of caught my attention. And I had said to myself for the longest time, boy, if I didn't know better, I would think Oliver has cognitive impairment. Hmm. And then they just kept, the symptoms kept, and the behaviors just kept um, getting worse and mimicking what I saw in human beings. So I finally took him to the vet. But I'd say the first, the first behaviors that really caught my attention, that reminded me of the humans that I 
have known and worked with was um, just kind of that that blank stare and the uh, the the constant staring, like they're just looking through things and confusion, um, not being able to find his way around to places that I know that he should have been able to, that type of thing. Oh, that's really fascinating. I, I had no idea. Most people don't, even, and yeah. self-included. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. So were you a caregiver for any of these people, a direct caregiver? I worked on a day-to-day basis with people in um, facilities uh, not as a caregiver, I was a, a more of a um, counselor. And then um, over my career, I was a regional director of uh, sales and marketing. And so I had the opportunity to set up um, dementia care programs, do a lot of training to caregivers. And set, I also set up um, the environments to the dementia wings at several facilities based on my expertise and and modalities and things like that as far as my own personal situation yes um, my husband and I helped take care of his mother Um, we weren't the primary caregivers but we were the secondary caregivers so over years we helped uh, we were kind of the the relief caregivers to their primary caregiver Mm -hmm. that's a very important role yes as a matter of fact there's a story about my mother-in-law in in my book (laughs) well tell us a little bit about your book why did you decide to write it well that's kind of an interesting story um i'll tell you what what the the aha moment was the trigger i was um i had my own business i helped place uh people into assisted living and memory care facilities. And I also counseled families and helped them understand uh, the disease, Um, taught people how to respond to the behaviors and help them understand what was happening to the brain. And these are all critical and essential components to um, going through the journey with people who are afflicted because it is a very complicated illness. There's a lot to it. And most of responses are actually counterintuitive. For example, I'll use the story of my mother-in-law. Um, I was sitting, we were taking care, I was taking care of her one Sunday and we were sitting in the living room just having a casual conversation. And all of a sudden she jumped up out of her chair and she said, oh my God, gosh, Marty's going to be so worried about me. He, I don't think he knows where I am and I have to go home and cook him dinner. Now, Marty was her husband, my father-in-law, and he had passed away four years earlier. So in a split second, she became confused and she believed that her husband was still alive and waiting for her at home and that he was going to be really upset if she wasn't there at the regular dinner time to serve him his dinner. Now the, the, um, the response that most people just kind of um, automatically think they should do is say, Oh no, don't you remember Marty passed away? He said, he, he died four years ago, mom. Don't you remember? That's kind of a knee-jerk response, and it happens a lot. A lot of people suffering from dementia all of a sudden out of nowhere believe their spouse is still alive or that their son is their brother or friend. They don't recognize them. And most people, their initial reaction is to try to remind the person the, the reality, our reality. But what people don't understand is our reality is not their reality for that moment. They have their short term memory basically has short circuited and they're back in another period of their time. So what I did because of all the training I've had is I said, Oh no, Marianne, 
Marty knows exactly where you were. As a matter of fact, he just called. And I told him you were here and that we were having a very nice visit. And I would bring you home in time for her, for you to cook him dinner. And that completely diffused the situation. And she said, are you sure? Are you sure? I said, oh, yes, everything's fine. I said, I'll take you home in a little while and you can fix him dinner. And he knows where you are and he's happy that you're having a nice visit with us. And that calmed her down. She sat back down and we finished our visit and then she forgot about it. Mm. So um, people also are under the misconception that that would might feel wrong to a lot of people because I had to tell her something that wasn't true. Right. But keep in mind, I was telling, I was joining her reality. If I had said to her, oh, mom, don't you remember that, that Marty died four years ago? That might be like she was hearing it for the first time and could have caused an absolute panic. Right. Because in her reality, she firmly believes he's still alive. Mm -hmm. So I had to come up with a way to join her reality to calm her down and diffuse the situation. And that's very different than just a blatant lie. So what I teach people is, you have to find a clever way to join their reality because it's more important than trying to correct them because no matter what you say to somebody who has dementia, whatever their belief is at that moment, you cannot change that belief. That's very true. So that's an example of uh, a lot of what I talk about in the book. Okay. Um, Every story that's in the book is a true story, Mm -hmm. and each story depicts a very common behavior that is associated with dementia and uh, just kind of illustrates the experience and um, hoping people will be able to, to recognize and identify those behaviors and then be familiar with them and understand that 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 particular behavior is part of the disease. And then kind of a, a, um, helpful hints on how to deal with it. Mm-hmm. That is very helpful. Well, how have readers responded to your book? You know, it's, it's, um, it's hit bestseller twice on Amazon and I think that probably um, the, the reviews have been um, extraordinary. And the, I'd say that the, um, probably the most common comment that I've heard from readers why they like the book is because they say it's relatable. They can actually relate uh, the, the information in the stories to their personal experiences with their whoever, if they're caring for somebody with dementia or um, a loved one with dementia. And they all, you know, they pretty much consistently say, I had no idea that that particular behavior was part of this disease. And I never would have thought that that was the reason why they were acting that way or why they were refusing to take a shower or, um, so it's been very helpful to people um, as they're journeying through this with their loved one. Okay. And you also have um, a blog that you keep on Facebook. And I see that you post um, pretty frequently information that's also helpful to caregivers. Do you want to talk about that? Well, just in the sense that I have, um, it's been a very common denominator over the 25 years that I've been doing this that I realized that um, there's very limited information about um, the day-to-day challenges that come up with this disease from a psychosocial aspect, um, the, primarily the quirky behaviors. And I've come to the realization that if people... Um, were more aware 
of what was happening to their brain, that these behaviors are associated with the illness and learn more about it, then they can have a much um, more effective and higher quality relationship with their loved one. I think you probably are well aware of this being an Alzheimer's daughter, right? Yeah, definitely. That a lot of family members don't go visit their loved ones in facilities because it's very uncomfortable. They don't know what to do. They don't know how to act. They don't know how to respond to these behaviors. So um, I have found that once they learn the information, it completely changes that. People don't go because they, they're just uncomfortable with the whole situation. So um, I think raising awareness and helping people understand and teaching people how to communicate with somebody afflicted with one of the brain diseases that causes dementia makes all the difference in the world. Um, I wanted to kind of go back to answer the question that I started to. You asked me what inspired me to write the book. So I was called over to this um, client's house and the wife's father had recently in the last year got had a diagnosis of Parkinson's disease and the husband's mother also had a recent diagnosis within the last year of Alzheimer's disease. Mm -hmm. They had the father, the, uh, the, the wife's father living with them, but the mother was in another state and they were referred to me by somebody who knew about my blog. So long story short, they had me come over and they just really wanted to get my advice on things and, and, and get some information that they were very frustrated. They were not able to get from other healthcare professionals. I think they each were diagnosed about a year earlier and they said that it's just been a struggle ever since because they basically felt like they were given the diagnoses and then that was it. No, not what to expect or where to obtain resources or anything like that. So I was there about two and a half hours and the, uh, the woman whose father has the Parkinson's disease stopped me and she said, Lisa, I just want to tell you that you've been here about two and a half hours, and I want to just share with you that I, we've, we've been able to get more helpful information from you in those two and a half hours than we have in the past year since we've gotten the diagnosis. Wow. And she said to me, you really need to write a book mm -hmm. because this information is impossible to find out there. And I had been hearing this for years, so this was not new information to me. But it was kind of an aha moment for me when she said, you really need to write a book. People are desperate for this information. So I did. I kind of walked away from my business and spent the next year writing the book and then probably the next year marketing the book. And I've been doing that ever since. And I, I do a lot of podcasts and radio shows and presentations to groups because I am very much aware that people really need to um, have their awareness um, opened up about this illness because it's everywhere. Everybody has a story. They know somebody or they have a family member or they are a caregiver, but this information on the day-to-day -day challenges that we face with this um, very unusual illness because of all the behaviors that come out of it. The behaviors are a result of the people trying to communicate something to us. And because they can't articulate it like we can when we have healthy brains, they try to communicate it through these strange behaviors so what it really comes down to is we all kind of have to become Sherlock Holmes and figure out what are they trying to tell us by acting this way or by behaving this way. So this is what I do is I expand people's awareness of what the communication, they're not trying to be difficult. Nobody is trying to be difficult. 
this is the only way they can can um, try to communicate that there's something that they need us to know. They're uncomfortable. They're in pain. They're hot. They're hungry. They have to go to the bathroom. And because they can't actually articulate that to us, especially when they get to the later stages of the illness, they communicate it through these strange behaviors. So this is what I'm kind of committed to doing now is helping people understand this because the average length of time that it takes to go from when you start seeing the, the symptoms and most people don't start showing the symptoms until they're already in the middle stages. Most people with brain disease aren't diagnosed until they're in their mid-stage because the early symptoms are very, um, very subtle. Eight to 20 years. My grandmother it was 20 years. That's a very, very long time for um, somebody to live with it and family members to go through the journey with them and have it be a very uncomfortable, hard, frustrating experience because you don't know how to communicate with one another. I remember as a teenager, my mother would take me over to see my grandmother who lived at, at a care home. I didn't know what to say to her. You know, she suffered from the hallucinations, the delusions, the, the, um, the uh, paranoia. And, you know, that's an uncomfortable position to, to be in if you don't know how to react to it. So I teach people how to react to it so it's comfortable. Well, that sounds very helpful. It makes me think of many of the authors that we have here at Al's Authors who also went out and wrote the book that they need, needed during their journey because there weren't enough resources from the real world. People who were, That's you know, been a clear message to me. Day. Yeah, so I'm glad. I'm actually um, just that that just uh, reinforces what my understanding is hearing that from you because that tells me that it's widespread that everybody really has a difficult time gaining access to what really matters, the day-to-day -day challenges that everybody faces when they're either caring for somebody or have a loved one with the disease. Was that your experience too, Marianne? Yes. Um, more specifically, when I, I worked in long-term care, Back in the 90s, that was my uh -huh. first exposure to um, working, you know, heavily with dementia patients. I had um, a couple of aunts that had the disease, but I wasn't, you know, like I wasn't a caregiver to them. And then I decided I wanted to write my, my own book and I tried to do some research and there really wasn't a lot of stuff out there from, you know, the front lines. You can find books written by doctors or neurologists and psychiatrists and social workers to tell you what you should do. Right. But people but want to know to deal with all these behaviors. Right. But people want to know, you know, somebody else's story and how did this person handle it? Because if, if they make it through, then I'm, I'll make it through too. I think that's absolutely because I think a lot of, and I've actually found that to be true. Um, working as a counselor with, with you know thousands of families that every, a lot of people feel that they're the only ones that are going through it and they feel isolated from others and when you share stories you realize oh other people have gone through this experience or going and it, it's reassuring I mean as we're all we're all seeing that during this isolation period that we rely very much on other human beings experiences, things that we can relate to and put in perspective for our own situations to help us get through it. And that's very true. People, family members, caregivers that care for people with dementia because it's, 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 it's an unusual world. It's a very unusual world. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people, because of the stigma attached to a dementia diagnosis, people are reluctant to reveal that their family member has dementia 
because they think it might diminish them in one way or another. It's, it's a brain disease. It's not something that you did wrong. It's not. Um, no, this is not mental illness. No. It's brain disease. It's organic. There's something happening to the brain. Right. And it's causing the, uh, you know, the behaviors and the symptoms. Just like when you, you know, have cancer. There are symptoms that indicate that you have some uh, uh, an illness going on. Well, it's the same with this. There, dementia really is a broad-based term used to describe symptoms of brain disease that cause cognitive impairment. It's not a disease in itself. So what dementia really describes are the symptoms that people get when they have a brain disease. And everybody has different symptoms, just like they do with cancer and the flu and a cold and and the other diseases. So, um, you know, my grandmother pretty much is a good example. She pretty much had them all. She had the delusions. She had the hallucinations. She had the paranoia. She had her fits of anger. Um, She had a lot of the more severe symptoms that we don't see in everybody, but all of these behaviors are common to dementia. Mm -hmm. Do you think your grandmother might have had Lewy body dementia? Because that's what that sounds like. When she was started displaying the, um, the uh, symptoms, there was so little known about it. it was back in the seventies that she actually was diagnosed as having senile dementia. Right. And she was treated like she was crazy. And she wasn't crazy. No. And never did actually know um, exactly what type of brain disease she had. But she could have had a mixture of them. That's not uncommon to have mixed. No, my stepfather did. He had three kinds of dementia. Yeah. Mixed dementia, they call it. Yeah. That's very true. Yeah. So I totally agree with everything that you're sharing, too, because that's been my experience as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I run a support group. I've been doing that at one of the um, uh, Sunrise facilities for the last three years. And, you know, I hear very, very common and similar experiences from the people that attend uh, my support group um, that I've been hearing from families, you know, for the last 25 years. I think everybody really kind of has similar emotions and feelings and fears and frustrations when they have a family member going, suffering from brain disease. I'm sure you probably have experienced that too. Oh yeah, for sure. But um, one of the issues that we've come to realize is people are so busy with caring that they don't have time to you know, learn or to meet with other people or talk to other people about what they're going through. Yeah, well, you know, uh, as of, I think, two years ago, the state of California actually increased their requirement for caregivers to, um, to obtain so many hours of continuing education on dementia because there's such a need for it when caring. Caring for people with dementia is so different than caring pe- for people with other types of illnesses like cancer or, you know, some of the other ones that you treat with medications. Right. It's a science in itself. So it only makes sense to me that people should have training on the proper way to care for somebody. How you respond to these behaviors can m- mean all the difference in the world to um, how that person afflicted with the brain disease will then react to the way you react. So doesn't it make sense that, you know, training people how to do it properly or more effectively to diminish the, um, the extremeness of these potential, you know, the, the potential extremeness of the behaviors makes sense. Let me, can I give you an example? Sure. Go ahead. So oh, there's a phenomenon with this disease called that it's called stranger in the mirror. And what happens is when somebody's short-term memory kind of short circuits and it can just happen in an instant and you never know that it's happened 
to your loved one or to the person you care for until they start saying things that don't make sense to your reality. But one of the things that happens in Stranger in the Mirror and why they call it that is because in reality, they're still the age that they are in real life, let's say 85. But if their short-term memory short circuits for however long that lasts, a minute, five minutes, a half an hour, they have now tapped into their long-term memory and that becomes their reality for whatever period of time that is. Maybe they're 25 years old for that given moment. That's their reality. Well, when they look in the mirror, they see a 25-year-old person, not an 85-year-old person. So this is one of the um, common things that happens to caregivers. One of the most difficult tasks to caregiving is bathing and showering. Sometimes the um, affected people are cooperative and sometimes they're absolutely just dig their heels in the ground and will not take a shower. Well, I've seen, you know, a lot of times where a caregiver will lead uh, the person that they're taking care of into a bathroom and the person looks in the mirror and they see somebody in the mirror that they don't recognize. So they think there's a stranger in the bathroom going to be watching them take their clothes off and be showered. Now, if somebody knew this, then they might know, well, okay, I can mitigate that situation by putting a cover over the mirror. Mm -hmm. But if you don't know that information, then it could be, you know, that stranger in the mirror phenomenon just happened to the person you're trying to shower. You wouldn't know that there was a way to uh, completely turn that situation around. That all it took was for you to cover put a towel over that mirror so they didn't see their own reflection thinking there was some stranger in the mirror and they absolutely were not going to take their clothes off in front of a stranger. And that's all it was. Nothing else. That is so enlightening. A lot of people would never ever in a million years have thought that that was the reason, but it's the absolute truth. It happens and it happens often. So that's why I say we have to kind of become detectives and figure out through process of elimination, why why am I seeing this behavior now? What's going on? Was it something like that? Are they having, are they hungry? Are they trying to tell us that, that they need to go to the bathroom? Are they uncomfortable? Do they have a rock in their shoe? So through process of elimination, huh? Are they bored? 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 Boredom? Absolutely. Boredom is is one of them. Yeah. So if we're aware that that the behaviors are the form of communication that they're trying to tell us that something is not quite right, then we can start through process of elimination figuring out what it could possibly be. Don't we do that with our babies when they start crying? Because that's the only way they can communicate. Well, of course, when when we're taking care as mothers, when we're taking care of our babies, we pretty much have it down to they're tired, they're hungry, they have a wet, a soiled diaper. Um, and those are the first things we look for, right? Mm-hmm. It's much more complicated than that with um, adults and Um, cognitively impaired adults. There are so many more things that we have to eliminate that could be going on, but it's the same concept. Right. They could be, you know, unwell. They could have a UTI or be coming down with the flu or something, and that would exacerbate their symptoms. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. UTIs are common, and and it happens in men, too. And they can really exacerbate behaviors. I mean, it's, yeah. So you're absolutely right about that. It can be really scary. If someone said to you today, my loved one has dementia, what would be your response? Hmm. 
my response would be, now's the time for you to learn as much as you can about what's happening to the brain and the different stages that people um, go through as they're um, processing through the journey. It's a long, drawn-out process, and I um, would encourage you to learn um, the different stages, the different behaviors that you see, what happens in each stage. Not everybody progresses through it um, the same. And to, um, to learn how to... Okay, so let me give you an example. What I, one of the things that I teach in my support group and what I first start out telling people is compare a diagnosis of dementia with somebody, an older person who's been able to hear perfectly well most of their life, and then all of a sudden they have lost their hearing. Now, you wouldn't want to just cut off communicating with that person to because they can't hear what you're saying. Mm-hmm. You're going to find a new way to communicate with that person, whether it be learning sign language or them learning how to read lips or you writing things down on a chalkboard or a piece of paper or getting them, you know, a special telephone to somehow you're going to figure out a way to communicate with that person. So you can continue a relationship with them. It's the same with dementia. Most people I think, or a lot of people, because it becomes difficult and uncomfortable, it's easier not to, communicate with them than have that wedge driven between you. But if you learn a new way, a different way, and an effective way to communicate with them, then you'll continue your relationship in a healthy way, Um, just like you would if that person lost their sight or lost their hearing. So that's what I would want people to understand is we're just going to learn a new way, an effective way to deal with this illness so you can continue um, a healthy and fulfilling relationship with your loved one. I've seen so many families just torn apart because of this illness, because it is uncomfortable and it is frustrating and people take the behaviors personally. I have had so many people tell me how hurt they feel because their loved one didn't recognize them. Well, maybe their short-term memory short-circuited for five minutes and they thought that it was their friend or their cousin and not their daughter or their son. Well, that's not personal. It's the disease that's causing that because basically the short-term memory has short-circuited. And it can last a very short period of time. It can last a long period of time. Um, So what I have experienced is once people understand all this, it helps them cope with the disease, and it really does help them um, have a healthier relationship with their loved one. Hmm. Thank you for that. Excellent advice. (laughs) You're welcome. Um, Would you be willing to read to us a little bit from your book? Oh, I'd love to. So let me read an, an excerpt. Well, Since I talked about my grandma and I dedicated my book to my grandmother and I mentioned that she displayed the gamut of bad behaviors when she was going through the illness. One of the chapters in the book is about a true story about her and I called it Birds in the Mattress. So Mm -hmm. let me... Let me read an excerpt. And I changed the names to, of course, protect... The, uh, the actual people. But um, this, is, this is from the actual chapter called Birds in the Mattress. Mrs. Walker is a nut. You need to do something with her, I overheard the police officer say to my mother. I was incensed. 
I wanted to scream at the officer. My grandmother's not crazy. She needs help. But I kept quiet. In those days, you didn't talk back to adults, especially police officers. I was a teenager, and it was just a few months after Nana told me about the birds in her mattress. What do you mean there are birds in your mattress, I asked. She responded saying, yes, and they peck at my face at night. What's wrong with my grandma, I thought. I wanted desperately to believe her, but what she was saying sounded impossible. Still, I checked the mattress on her bed inside and out. I don't see anything, Grandma. How are they getting in? Oh, they're very clever, she said. I went home and told my mom, who had already heard about the birds in the mattress. My mom revealed that Nana also thought people were stealing her jewelry and that she refused to take showers because she was convinced that the men men were coming to kill her. Why didn't you say anything, I asked my mother. She looked down and took a drag from her cigarette, but remained silent. In those days, you didn't talk about what we thought was mental illness. Over the next several months, the behaviors worsened. Nana called the police several times a day to report the birds, the thieves, and the men who were going to kill her. The trouble came to a head one day when Nana was driving to the store and became so disoriented that she stopped in the middle of a four-lane street got out of her car and started wandering around. A concerned citizen saw her and called the police, who called my mother and took Nana home. It was later that afternoon, back at Nana's house, where the officer scolded my mom and called her a nut right in front of us. The incident prompted my mother to take Nana to a doctor who diagnosed her with what they called back then senile dementia which is synonymous with today's Alzheimer's diagnosis. Nana was placed in a board and care facility where we visited her regularly until her death. I still think about the officer who called my Nana crazy, and I can still recall the anger I felt toward him. But now that I have experience with the disease, I see his comment through a different lens. After all, it has been 40 years. And dismissing her as a nut was his reaction to his unfamiliarity with brain disease. As much as I would like to, I can't go back in time and change the police officer's mind about my grandmother being crazy. But moving forward, I can honor my grandmother's memory by educating people about the disease. She was my first experience with Alzheimer's and I need, I, and the need I felt to help her still drives me today. That's beautiful. Thank you. Yeah, it sounds like it became your life's work. Well, you know what's interesting is now, you know, press forward 40 years, I still hear that um, on a very regular basis that people think that their loved one is just all of a sudden gone crazy because they don't recognize that these behaviors are part of the illness. I'm finding that true today. Is that has that been your experience too? Yeah, I think so. You know, and it takes work, and people um, don't always want to put in the work. I agree with that. Yeah, you know, it takes time. I mean, a lot of people have to give up everything to care for their loved one. You know, I know people who have given up their their jobs, their careers, mm-hmm. their homes. Some of our uh, there are authors and Al's authors who have literally moved cross country to go back home to take care of their mom or dad. Yeah, and, I see. Um, that. Three well, years, and then you don't. What do you have at the end of that? What remains? Well, and the other thing that I've seen over the years is kind of families divide into camps about what they believe should be happening. And then you have your other side of the camp that believes something completely different. So that drives wedges into families. And I think what it all boils down to is a lack of understanding of the disease. So if we can understand it and recognize these behaviors and know what, you know, the meaning is behind them, we can also help bring families back together. Yeah, that's a, that's a good goal. You know, there's a lot of healing to be done. And people there really afraid, is. You know, people are afraid that 
it's contagious or it's genetic and maybe I'm going to get it too. So I get that a lot that too. Yes. And I get that a lot. Sometimes people who have the disease are afraid that they have given it to their children through the genes. And that's very pro. Right. That's a big worry. So what that all boils down to is a lack of understanding. We need education and awareness and you know, if we don't if we don't find a cure for this disease in the next 30 years, one out of two of us are going to have it. That's sobering. And that should wake you up. Isn't it? Yeah. It's very scary. sobering. Yeah. So there are resources available today, such as Al's Authors or the Alzheimer's Association, which if you have that in your area, you could call them and get literature and information, but also attend support groups. And I think they even have case managers that will work with you one-on-one to make a better situation. Yeah, I think just through your organization, aren't there over 200 authors that have written books on this subject and basically are sharing their personal experiences, whether it's with a family member or as a caregiver that uh, people have access to that um, probably will help them in their current situations just by reading other people's experiences. Isn't that? Yep, absolutely. That's our whole premise because the founders of which I am one, um, you know, we, they, we went through our journeys and we couldn't find the information that we wanted and we decided to write it from our own experience and share it that way. Because then, you know, you, you end up at the end with so much knowledge, it seems a shame not to share it. Oh, I agree wholeheartedly. That's what I, why I have written the book and why I have a blog and because like you, I've had the same experience. I can't tell you how many people over the years have told me I can't find information on how to deal with this. Yeah. So. And as a matter of fact, I've had people tell me that they've read the book. I had this one friend whose mother suffered from Alzheimer's disease, and it probably was 15-year period. And they went through all the emotions, the frustration and the helplessness and the hopelessness and the bizarre behaviors and not knowing how to respond and all, all the things that we've been talking about. And she passed away and he read my book after years after she passed away. And he came back to me and said, thank you, Lisa. The information in the book that I had no idea about helped give me closure to understanding better what my mother was going through and helped give me closure and feel better about the whole situation. And I wished I had known that information when she was going through it, but it helped him even after the fact, because it said Mm -hmm. things in perspective and it helped give him closure to understanding better and he said he always had this shadow of guilt holding over his head because he never thought he was doing anything right yeah I I've heard that from several right people now. I've heard that from several people mm-hmm. over the the years since the book came out yeah I'm thankful for I'm 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 glad that that has given them some peace of mind because it is a very difficult thing to journey through with with you know, your parent or your mother or your father or even as a caregiver, it's one of the hardest jobs anybody will ever have to do taking care of somebody with cognitive impairment. Mm-hmm. So true. Okay. Well, thank you so much for giving us your time and your expertise and all of your wonderful insight. Where you are very welcome. Thank you again for, for having me. And I hope this will end up being helpful to a lot of people. Oh, I'm sure it will be. Where can people find your book? It's on Amazon. And the title of the book is Not All Who Wander Need Be Lost. And if you're interested in, um, in ongoing information, I post tips on the blog. Very same, a lot, a lot of the same information that we've talked about today. Um, and it's on Facebook, and it's the same title as the book. So just 
put in not all who wander need be lost in the search and my blog will come up. So if you're looking for help for information that can help you um, cope better with uh, this illness, then I post a lot of this information on an ongoing basis on my blog that you can uh, access. Yes, and it's very helpful. I, I reviewed that earlier, and you have a lot of Oh, good thank stuff. you. Thank yeah, you very you much. A lot of good stuff on there, so I signed up as a follower, and I encourage Oh, I'm glad. To thank you very much. Yeah, it's important to keep connected and to learn every day. Learn something new, one thing. Yes. Yes, it's a very complicated situation, and I still learn new things. Mm-hmm. I never stop researching. I don't ever stop looking for... Uh, new information so I can share it with um, people who really desperately need it. That's great. So thanks again, Lisa. And stay well. (laughs) You too, Marianne. Thanks again for having me. I enjoyed being a guest on your show. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to Untangling Alzheimer's and Dementia, an Alz Authors podcast. For more details on this episode, please see the show notes. For more info on All's Authors, please visit allsauthors.com. While you're there, be sure to browse our online bookstore of more than 250 carefully vetted books on Alzheimer's and dementia. You can also find us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Please email your thoughts on the podcast to allsauthors at gmail.com. Remember, you are not alone. One can sing a lonely song, but we chose to form a choir and create harmony.